We're brought here today by the love that Sarah and Davis share for each other. We're going to be so happy. We'll be so happy. I'm going to crush it at being a husband. I really hope she looks like her picture. Pete says she has a good personality. That's a red flag. Davis! Whoa, that is one beautiful personality. Cutie alert. Thank, Thank you, you, Pete. Pete. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. I, uh, oh. I got you a latte. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, latte. <laughs> Why did I just say that? <laughs> Quick, say something. Oh, yeah, that's dairy. Probably shouldn't immediately correct him. Uh, so do you... sports? Failure. Yeah, I love golf. What? No, I don't. I hate golf. Uh, me too. Yes, I love with the chipping and the putting birdies. Nope, tweet, tweet. <laughs> Get a hold of yourself. Um, so what are you looking for in, in a relationship? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna die alone. Uh, oh. Um, you know, it's, uh, um... Someone just like me. Someone who's just kind of their own person. Someone pretty adventurous. Someone who likes to stay at home. Someone who'll just listen to me. Someone who doesn't talk too much. Someone who isn't intimidated by how much money I make. Somebody who doesn't mind how little money I make. He looks like a good dad. Hope she doesn't want kids, like, soon. Um, you know, it's, uh, like another person. Oh, that's me. I mean, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I love her. Yeah. Wow, time flew by. <laughs> it's over? Think fast. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, you gotta, uh, do you want me to, huh. maybe... Should I give her a hug? Is that weird? No. <laughs> Okay. No, kiss. Ha, okay. No, wait. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Uh, this is great. What is this... happening? <laughs> Go. Okay. Ooh, he smells good. <laughs> well, I'll just see you. Well, you messed that up. It's okay. We'll crush our second date. <laughs> well, if you want to see what's happening to this couple, make sure you come for the last installment of our series next week. Um, next week, you're going to see one year after their marriage. That's a sneak peek for you, all right? But let me first formally welcome all of you to the Rocks Church. If this is your first time coming to our church, let me tell you, you are a very, very special guest. We uh, like to say at the beginning of our message that our slogan here is, No Perfect People Allowed. We really mean it. And we gather here every Sunday because we really believe that we are in need of God's grace and God's forgiveness uh, and God has made that available to us through Jesus Christ. So whoever you are, wherever you are in your faith journey, whatever you think you've done or haven't done, you are at the right place here this morning. You're not going to be judged. We are on the same journey. Some people have been further along than others, but we are in the same faith journey together. So we'd love you to join uh, this, this faith family in this place, all right? I want to welcome also all our friends from all over the world tuning in through podcasts and YouTube. Thanks for joining in as well. Hey guys, guess what? Uh, two days ago on uh, Friday was our 22nd wedding anniversary, believe it or not. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Yes, I married up, that's for sure. And um, I just want to ask you, who here has been married 25 years or more? 25, would you please stand? If you've been married 25 years or more, would you please stand where you are? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Look at that. Stay standing. Stay standing. Now, if you've been married 30 years or more, stay standing. 30 years or more. All right. How about 40 years or more? Remain standing. 40 years or more. Come on! All right. 50 years or more. 50 years or more. This two here. 50 years or more. Wow. All right. 51 years. 52. 53. That's my parents. Wow. <laughs> 53 years. Man, they produce at least one good son. That's for sure. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Maybe I should have them up here to speak to us <laughs> instead of me. But anyway, wonderful. Hey, um, I read a story about a guy who's been married for 65 years. 65 years. And he's being interviewed by a local radio station. And the interviewer asks, congratulations, amazing, 65 years. What's the secret of your long, happy marriage? And the guy said, well, you see, it, this is how it is. In my house, the man makes all the big decisions. And the woman just makes the small decisions. Really? The interviewer was surprised. That really works? And the guy beamingly said, yes, it does. So far, 65 years, not one big decision. <laughs> Some of you will get it someday. Okay. <laughs> 22 years, same rule in our house, not one big decision. <laughs> Anyway, we are in the third part of our series, Happily Ever After. And I want to start this third part by, uh, by saying a few assumptions that I should have said at the beginning of our series, okay? Uh, but still, I want it out there. This has always been the assumption as we started this series. And the first assumption is this, that we're not talking about dating relationships here, okay? We're talking about committed marriage relationships. What that means is, if you are dating a loser boyfriend, if your mom is telling you you're dating a loser boyfriend, lose him, okay? <laughs> Trust your mom. So we're not asking you to be committed to that loser boyfriend. That's not what I'm asking. We're talking about marriage relationships here, all right? Second assumption is, uh, oh, by the way, this is, this is true. Uh, before you're married, you get married because you love. After you are married, though, you love because you are married. You don't stay married because you love, but you love because you are married. So stop wondering if you married the right person, okay? Stop asking God, why did I marry her? Why did I marry him? You know, I don't even love her. I don't even love him. No, when you are married already, your job is to love because you are married. Okay, that's the assumption. Second assumption, we're not talking about your past relationship or relationships, we're not here to judge you. If you're looking for a church that demonized you for your past mistakes, for your divorce and all that, you're looking at the wrong church, okay? We're here not talking about your past relationships, but we're here talking about your present and your future relationship. There's no condemnation here in this place. I realize I'm not taking it lightly. I realize the hurt it has caused you and a lot of people, children especially, so I'm not, you know, taking this lightly at all. But I'm just saying we're not here to talk about your past. We're not here to condemn your past, but we're here to talk about your future. We think we're here to talk about your present. And then finally, this is also very important. We're not asking you to stay in an abusive relationship. If you are in an abusive relationship, stop calling on the Lord. Start calling on the police, okay? <laughs> Come to this church, grab someone who barely looks a Christian. Uh, Rohan has a big body. Grab him. <laughs> Bring him home, all right, to protect you, okay? We're not talking about making you stay in an abusive relationship. Sometimes it is good, it's important actually, it's necessary for you to take a break if you are in an abusive relationship, okay? But... We started this series, and we're going to say it again because this is the foundation of uh, what we talk about together. We all come into a relationship carrying this invisible box of hopes, dreams, and desires. If you are single, all right, lean in because you too have your own box of hopes, dreams, and desires uh, that you wish that, you know, your next relationship or your future relationship will look. For example, how much money you're going to make, how you're going to spend your money, uh, what kind of house you want to live in, who's doing what around the house, and how you're going to resolve conflict, how many children you're going to have, and what kind of car you want to drive, what your wife will not wear at night, and so on. You have that hopes, dreams, and desires. The problem is, somewhere along the way, what started as legitimate desires turns into 
what we call expectations, okay? And when desires, when desires became expectations, the dynamic of your relationship changes to a debt debtor relationship, and that's not good, all right? Because your marriage relationship is not meant to be a debt debtor relationship. Let me tell you why. Because if you are in a relationship where everything is transactional, okay, what used to be enjoyable becomes transactional, and that's not going to bring you joy in your relationship. Romance is out the window, okay? Remember when you used to date last time? How you used to love doing things for one another? How you don't mind spending a large amount of money taking her to a nice restaurant? How you don't mind picking her up at 3 o'clock in the morning at the airport because you just miss her so much, right? But now, 3 o'clock, take Uber, baby. <laughs> yeah. That's what Uber is for, you know? Um, how come you don't pick me up? See, what used to be enjoyable because there's no expectation. You just love doing it for one another. In fact, you try to outdo giving and serving and loving one another. But when, when desires became expectations, what used to be enjoyable suddenly now become a chore, right? Suddenly like, oh man. But then again, we kind of expect it. Isn't that what a husband's supposed to do? Isn't that what a wife's supposed to do? Isn't that what every woman is supposed to do? Isn't that what every man is supposed to do in a relationship? So we have these expectations that we put on our, on our spouse and things become less and less enjoyable when you put that kind of pressure on your spouse. And guess what? When you are a good negotiator in a transactional relationship, you always win, correct? Because you are such a good negotiator, you convince him how to be a husband, how to be a good husband. You convince her that your box is better than her box. You see, because you're such a good negotiator and you think you win. Ah, oh, finally, he's beginning to understand. Oh, finally, she's seeing it my way. But guess what? If you always win, all right, that's not good. In a relationship, when someone wins all the time, the relationship loses. When I win all the time, we lose this. All right? When I win, we lose us. The, re the relationship loses. It's not good. You think it's good because you think your spouse is finally seeing things your way, but no, right? Just, that's just from your perspective. That's just from your point of view. That's why we said a Christian marriage is actually a submission competition. We try to outdo one another in submitting to one another. We try to raise the back of the line in order to love, in order to serve one another. And we got this idea from Jesus. Jesus reduced 600 and something Jewish laws into two, into one, when he says, love one another. How? As I have loved you, so you should love one another. And Paul took this principle, and then he puts it in a marriage principle. And Paul says it this way, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I'm doing this as, not only as a review, but I don't really mind repeating the same information again. If you've been here for the past two weeks, you're like, oh, okay, I heard this before. But this is so foundational. Let me tell you, I can't overemphasize this enough. This is so foundational. This is so important. There's no amount of good marriage books, seminars, podcasts, and all that that you can listen to, read, and attend unless you really understand this basic principle. That's why I need to be reminded of this principle again and again and again. So Paul says, if you want happily ever after, if you want your marriage to thrive, you need to learn to submit to one another. You see? And then you do this not because you have to, but because you do it out of reverence for Jesus Christ. That sense of awe that you have toward your God. That sense of gratitude that you have toward God. Channel that not just by coming to church, Channel that, not just by singing songs. Paul says, channel that into your relationship. Channel that awe. Channel that gratitude into your relationship with one another. That's how you revere me. You don't just revere me through songs, you know. I can hear better songs in heaven, right? But revere me by submitting to one another. And then Paul breaks this down into a specific task for wives 
and for husbands. For example, the first thing, for wives. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Again, not because you have to, but as you do to the Lord. Now, we get all riled up about, about this submission thing, but actually, no, this is just a sub-command. Remember that. The main command is submit to one another, right? That's verse 21. This is the outworking of it. It doesn't mean husband is not, is not supposed to submit, but we all have to submit to one another, 521. But this is how the role of the wife should be played out in that relationship. How many of you have been watching the World Cup? Man, I put $10 on Australia. <laughs> almost, almost won it. But, you know, you, any one of you who understands professional sports, you know that in order for a team, any team to win, everybody needs to play their role, correct? I mean, you, ca you can't all be a striker. You can't. Somebody has to defend, right? So, uh, somebody has to coach. See, unless everybody understands their role, and then be good at their role, you can't win in a game. Same thing. It's not like wives are lower than the husbands. Don't, don't have that idea at all. Listen to last week's sermon if you don't believe me, all right? It's not that you are lower than men, but you are playing an important role in your marriage relationship. You know that, wives. You're playing such an important role in your relationship. You need, we need you to support us. We need you to walk alongside us and help us. That's your role, all right? So wives, submit yourself to your own husband as to the Lord. And husbands, the same. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's our job. The way submission works out for a man is by loving. When you love, that means you are submitting to your wife. Love, not because you have to, but because Jesus Christ would want you to, okay? What about if you have a husband not worth submitting to? What if you have a wife who is not submissive? What do you do then? Well, Paul would say to you, wife, this is your job. Submit to your husband even when he has not loved you. You love, you submit to him as an expression of your love for Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has given himself for you in the first place. All right? So you have to learn to submit to your husband even when he has not loved you. All right? That's your role as, as a wife. And then husband, you're not off the hook either. You love your wife even when she has not respected you. You know, I know it's difficult, right? But that's our call. You know, I'm not here for you because you are here for me. That is transactional. Remember that term again. I'm not here because you are here for me. I'm not here for you because you're here for me. No, I'm here for you because Jesus Christ has been here for me and will always be here for me. That's why we end last week by saying this. It is easy to submit to a loving husband and then it is equally easy to love a submissive wife. Isn't that good? It is easy to submit to a loving husband and it is easy to love a submissive wife. The opposite is true too. You know, it works the other way. It is difficult to submit to a non-loving husband. Let me tell you. Wives, I understand your plight. You know, some of your husbands are abusive. They're not worth submitting to. It is not easy to submit to a non-loving husband. And it is not easy to love a non-submissive wife. Let me tell you. Based not on experience. All right? <laughs> I heard people say it's not easy to love a non-submissive wife. I never had that experience. <laughs> but I like to keep things in the positive, okay? It is easy to submit to a loving husband, and it's easy to love a submissive wife. That means, wives, if you want your husband to love you, learn to be submissive. You let go of the rope first. All right? Don't wait until your husband loves you, then you will be submissive to him. No, you submit first. You submit first, and then you wait. You wait and see. He will learn to love you more and more. Same thing, husband. Don't wait until your wife is submissive first. Love her like Jesus would love her. All right? And then you will see, you know, because if everybody waits for one another to make the first move, man, it's not going to go anywhere. So let me ask you. 
Wives, does he know that you respect him? Does he? What do you do that makes him feel respected or unrespected? Do you know that? If you don't, you got to have that conversation. Not right away in the car after church, but find a good time and ask your, your husband, hey, do you know that I respect you? Can you tell me what is it that I do that make you feel respected? Because I want to do better at that. And tell me what I do that make you feel unrespected. Because I want to avoid that. I want to learn. I want to learn how I can show my respect to you. Have that conversation. Let me tell you. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fantastic. This is what makes the relationship amazing. This is what makes marriage amazing. If you learn to ask this question to one another. And husbands, same thing. Does she know that you love her? Does she really? What do you do that makes her feel loved or unloved? Ask her that question. Hey, you know, uh, babe, what, what, what is it that I do that makes you feel unloved? What is it that I do that makes you feel loved? Because I want to learn to be a better husband, right? Does she know that you love her? I heard a story about a guy who's been married for 30 years, and he's never said, I love you to his wife. And his wife was like, why you never told me that you love me anymore? And I said, I did. When? 30 years ago when we got married. <laughs> and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. You know, that's not a good answer, all right? Not a good answer. Uh, you need to tell her, okay? You need to ask her, what is it that I do that can make you feel more love? Uh, grab a book by Gary Chapman called Five Love Languages. Very powerful, all right? You need to learn your spouse's love language. Some of you might be saying, hey, you know, I don't really care about this stuff, you know. I don't care about this stuff. Well, men do care about this stuff. But <laughs> I don't care about the house that I live in. I don't care about um, uh, the job that my husband has. I don't have expectation about kids and all that. But I do have some desires, some legitimate needs like this, you know. Every one of us has. And it's not wrong, okay. You need to be respected. I do too. You need to be desired. You need to be admired, husbands especially. Now, let me tell you ladies, all right? This is worth coming to church for. We husbands, we want to be admired. Let me tell you why, okay? Because almost every hour of every day, we wonder, we men wonder if we are good enough for the task. We wonder if we are up to the task. We wonder if we are a good enough husband. We wonder if we are a good enough dad. We wonder if we are a good enough worker in the office. We have that thought. So we need you to admire us because we are insecure that way for most men. Let me tell you that, right? So we have these legitimate desires to be cherished, to be protected, to be defended, to be trusted. We don't want anybody following us around all the time. We need to be prioritized. You know, I don't want to compete with his car. I don't want to compete with her job, right? We want to be pursued. We want to be uh, attracted to. These are all legitimate desires. The question is, who can meet all these desires for us? Okay? Let me tell you. Your husband, your wife cannot meet all that legitimate desires. By the way, I believe God put that desires in there, in your box. But for you to put that on your husband is very heavy. Okay? And nobody, no husband, no wife can meet all these desires. That's a unicorn. It doesn't exist. So what do we do with our unmet desires? Well, you have three options. Number one, you ignore. All right? Just let it pass. Ah, maybe this is what marriage is all about. But you're not supposed to ignore your marriage because God meant your marriage to thrive, to be celebrated. When you ignore what God meant to celebrate, it will eventually frustrate Sounds good, right? It's not from me. Somebody else said that first. <laughs> but if you ignore, right, what God wants you to celebrate, it's going to frustrate you after some time. How about staying busy? Staying busy is not a good option either. Maybe it works out for a while. You know, okay, you do your stuff, I do my stuff. As long as we're not quarreling all the time, as long as we're not fighting all the time, I'm fine with that. Again, you know, survival is not the goal of marriage. You don't just get married to survive. You want it to thrive. All right, that's God's idea for your marriage. And it's not too late, let me tell you. I'm not talking about your past. I'm talking about from this day forward, right? From this day forward. Or number three, this is the option that people take, is find someone else. 
Find someone else. And you've been in that situation maybe for some of you. How many of you have heard of the Pareto Principle? You know what the Pareto Principle is? Also known as the 80-20 rule or 80-20 principle. And it, it, it's applicable in so many different areas in leadership, in business, for example, in the church as well. Like 20% of the people does 80% of the giving. 20% of what you do produce 80% of the profit for your company. That's called the 80-20 rule. But I heard a pastor who used this principle and applies it to marriage. He said it's applicable to marriage as well because this is how it works. In a relationship, no one can give you 100% of what you desire. We talk about that, yeah? But here's the amazing thing. People leave the 80% that they love to get the 20% that they want. This is also why people leave church. Do you know that? You know, they love the gathering. You love the gathering. You love the worship. You love the fact that people are getting baptized. People uh, are getting saved and all that. And then one day, the pastor forgot your name. The pastor forgot to call you on your birthday or something. And then you leave the church for the 20%, even though you love the 80%, everything that's happening. And in a relationship, it's the same. You love everything about your wife, but there's that 20% that caused you to be so upset. And then in the office, there's an attractive girl that comes to you. She has the 20% that your wife doesn't have because she gives you three children already, right? And you choose to leave the 80%, the good 80% for the sake of the 20%. And then you realize 20% is all that person has, you know? Even the 80% has another 20%. So uh, for our church, it's maybe 30, 40%. If you stick by wrong, long enough, you'll find out more things that you don't like in this church. But that's the, that's the truth, isn't it? And it's quite sad. Now, don't leave. That's my advice, right? Option number three, don't find another just because your husband or your wife cannot fulfill all your desires. So what do we do? What do you do with your unmet hopes, dreams, and desires? This is what we're going to spend the rest of our time in um, very quickly. It's very simple, but very important. It's very profound. This is what's going to save your marriage, okay? Let me tell you. This is what's going to make your marriage to thrive. You come into a wedding, into a relationship, into marriage because of love. But this is the thing that keeps love strong. This is the thing that keeps love dedicated and committed, okay? I'm talking about grace. you got to make grace to be the foundation of your marriage. Once again, I said, you come into a marriage relationship because of love, but grace is the grease that makes this love alive, that makes this life love committed, you know, that makes this love good, okay? So grace needs to be the foundation of your relationship. Every happy couple knows this, all right? Because guess what? You are married to quite a sinner. You are. I am married to a sinner. My wife is married to a sinner, but a sinner saved by God's grace, okay? So you got to make grace the foundation of your relationship. Okay, this is how it works out. Number one, rely on God's grace to meet your hopes, dreams, and desires. Because there's not one person in the world that can do all of that. You need to rely on God's grace to meet all of that. Jesus says to Paul at one time, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. It's enough for you. God knows what you need. If it's important to you, it's important to God. And then Peter, the Apostle Peter, the big mouth Peter, he puts it this way, and this is fantastic. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Trust God's timing. He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. Cast this box to God because God cares for you. Don't put it on your husband. Don't put it on your wife. Put it on God. God can take it. If you're frustrated about your husband, about your wife, take it to God. 
Be honest. Stop praying polite prayers. All right? Read the psalm. You know some of the prayers are not polite at all. So be honest with God. God knows what is inside your heart anyway. Right? Here's what's interesting about these two verses. In the original language, I'm a bit of a Greek freak. There's only one command. And the command is be humble. That's the only imperative. Cast is actually not a command in the original language. Cast is a participle. What does that mean? It should be read like this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time, casting all your cares on Him because He cares for you. That means the command is one. Be humble before God. And how you be humble is by casting, not some, not a few, the way you... The way you be humble before God is by casting all your cares on God because, guess what? He cares for you. When you don't cast all your cares on God, you are prideful. You said, no, I don't need you, God. I can take care of this on my own. God doesn't want you to take care of things on your own. God says, cast all. Not some, cast all of it on me. That's what true humility means. Humility, a lot of Christians don't understand humility. Humility is not your ability to act embarrassed when people tell you how wonderful you are. That's not humility. Oh, you have a wonderful voice. Oh, no, it was Jesus. You know? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> if it's Jesus, it would have been so much better. <laughs> right? My mom is, is, is good at this. You know, she's a great cook, but try to praise her cooking. She will say, no, nah, no, nah, it's too salty, too salty. You know, she, she's good at self-depreciating, you know. <laughs> oh, your son is such a good preacher. He's a good pastor. No, 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 no. he never showers. He never showers. You know, like, no, mom, just say thank you. Just say thank you. Stop it. <laughs> That's not humility, all right? But people think that's like, you know, if you act embarrassed when people tell you, tell you you're good. No, just say thank you. Praise God, right? But learn to cast your cares on God, yeah? We all need to learn to cast our cares on God. You know why? Because He cares for us. If you don't cast your cares on God, guess what? You're, starting to, you're gonna start casting that cares on your husband, on your wife. It's gonna be difficult for them to meet all of that, right? I can't meet all of that for Hulda. And Hulda can't meet all of that for me. So learn to cast your cares on God. Number two, very quickly, give your spouse the grace that God through Jesus Christ has given you. Okay? Like I said, you are married to quite a sinner. You are married to, a, to someone who possibly is selfish, lazy, and all that. And that's, that's all of us, isn't it? In, in one sense or another. So we need each other to be gracious to one another. I told Hulda, hey, you know, I, this is not a, an excuse. This is not a cop-out. By the way, this is not an excuse for you to do whatever you want, all right? But you have to understand and talk it out again. Please be gracious with me. Please be gracious with me. Please extend your grace towards me. There will be a time, from time to time, I need you to carry me. From time to time, I need you to cover for me. From time to time, I need you to be patient with me. I need you to protect me. From time to time, I need you to believe in me when I don't believe in myself. I need you to speak word of faith over my life when I don't even believe in myself anymore. I need that grace in my life as a husband, you know. I need that because I'm not perfect. And your wife, your husband needs that as well. So give your spouse the grace of God that you have already received from Him. That's why I said, if you're not a Christian, it might be difficult for you to extend grace when you have not already experienced grace yourself. And this morning, I'm telling you the good news is, God is gracious to you. He gave you Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. You know, relationship with God is not based on how well we perform our religious duties. Eternal life is not about good works. It's not about, you know, how much you read the Bible, or how often you go to church. Eternal life is about believing that God has done everything for you, even in your moment of weakness. When you were still a sinner, the Bible says, God already sent Jesus to die for you. That's how gracious God is for you. So that when you believe in Him, the Bible says you, don't, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. That's a free gift 
even though you don't deserve it. That's what grace is. It's undeserved favor. God gives you His undeserved favor so that you can have eternal life that you don't deserve because Jesus died to give you that eternal life, right? That's Christianity. Now, unless you experience that, it might be difficult for you to extend that to your spouse. When we come into a relationship with God, we are in big, big debt because of our sins toward God. We offend the Almighty God, the Holy God, the one true God. But then Paul turns that around by saying this, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. You know, if you want to be indebted to one another, be indebted in this area, in the area of love. All right? Remember in the first week we said, you know, you have to believe, you have to have this mindset, this philosophy in mind. My wife, my husband owes me nothing, but I owe them everything. All right? I owe them love. And then, uh, same principle, but Peter, at one point, asked Jesus. You know, he was so smug, I believe, when he was saying this to Jesus. He said, uh, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? You see, you're pretty good if you can forgive another person seven times in a row. So Peter was quite smug, as I said, that, man, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm a patient person. I'm a forgiving person. Seven times? Jesus answered, no, I tell you. Not seven times, but 77 times. Other translation says 70 times seven. That means boundless, limitless. It's not like, you know, on the 491th time you can cut their throat. No, all right? It means keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. How many times... Am I gracious to you? If God were to ask you, how many times have I forgiven you? Again and again and again. 490? More than that. You know? God is gracious to us. And you need to learn. I need to learn to extend that grace to my wife, to my husband. Right? Let me tell you. If nagging doesn't work, if coercing doesn't work, if demanding, transacting, all the ing doesn't work, try grace. Try grace. I challenge you to try grace. Grace is the oil, the foundation that keeps love alive in your relationship. Try grace. If it doesn't work, come back to me. I'll shave my head <laughs> if it doesn't work. Okay? I'll tell you. You need to start first. There's nobody perfect in this world. Nobody perfect. That's why we need grace. Yeah? As God has shown us grace, we need to extend grace to one another. There's this little advertisement coming from Singapore 10 years ago. I think about 10, it was about 10 years ago. That was the first time when I saw this. It is an ad to start a new family. But it's such a wonderful ad that reminds us that nobody's perfect, but that's not why we are in a relationship. So let's watch this, and then I will close in prayer. Mrs. Lee, I believe you have some words to say about the daily departed. I'm not going to sing praises for my late husband, not today. Neither am I going to talk about how good he was. Enough people have done that here. Instead, I want to talk about some things that will make some of you feel a bit uncomfortable. First off, I want to talk about what happened in bed. Ever had difficulty starting your car engine in the morning? <sighs> Well, that's exactly what David's snoring sounded like. But wait, snoring wasn't everything. There was also this rear end wind action going on as well. Some nights, it would be so forceful, it would wake him up. What was that? He would ask. 
Oh, it's the dog, I would say. Go back to sleep, dear. Oh, you might find this all very funny, but towards the end of his life, when his illness was at its worst, these sounds indicated to me that my David was still alive. And what I wouldn't give just to hear those sounds again before I sleep. In the end, it's these small things that you remember, the little imperfections that make them perfect for you. So to my beautiful children, I hope one day you too find yourselves life partners who are as beautifully imperfect as your father was to me. Stand on your feet as we close our gathering together this morning. There's nobody perfect. You're not perfect. Your partner's not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect partner. As God has shown us His grace, we need to extend that same grace to one another. Rely on His grace for yourself, trusting that His grace is enough for you. To meet all your needs and desires. In a few minutes, I'm going to close by prayer, praying a prayer of blessing. If you need prayer for whatever reason, please come forward. Our prayer leaders would love to pray for you. If you're sick, if you're struggling with anything, just come forward. They would love to pray with you. And if you're new to our church, don't go home right away. Join me at the new guest lounge over coffee. We have a free gift for you. Maybe there's some scratches in there. Uh, I don't know, but get to know us. We'd like to get to know you, and um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we heard. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Where would we, where would we be had it not been for your grace? And Father, I pray, as we have received grace from you, may we extend that grace to our spouse, to one another. I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. May God bless your marriage. May God bless your relationship. May God bless your work, your business, your children, their relationship. May God bless everything that you do so that through you, people around you, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers will be blessed and God's name will be glorified now and forevermore. All God's people who are blessed, say together with me, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week, everybody. God bless.